first off, this idea of the resurrection. Uh, churches, it's really strange. We often say he is risen, he is risen indeed, and we do it one Sunday a year. But yet the king has, has come. He is resurrected. And it's 365 days. Every Sunday we should say he's risen. He's risen indeed. We should celebrate it because we live in a post-resurrected world. And we should be thankful for that because God's people waited centuries and they waited and they waited for God's promise to come to fruition. Now, let's, let's begin. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. This is a rather significant passage as it relates to the resurrection. First, we have to look into the context. We really do. And we have to understand that the church of Corinth was had some struggles internally and the apostle paul is trying to deal with some of the struggles and some of the compromises within the church paul immediately following this passage says that we are to be the most pity if jesus did not rise from the dead his human body did not rise from the dead and the emphasis is the human body and see the greek culture was heavily influencing the church at that time and so there was, at the, in the early church days, the question of God's character was not whether he was God, but whether he was actually human. And there's a good reason there was that question happening. See, there was irrefutable evidence that, God, that Jesus was God. Remember, he spoke, he taught, he did miracles amongst thousands of people. Paul even mentions that there were 500 witnesses that Jesus encountered post-resurrection. These are people from a vast different groups. These were fishermen, these were tax collectors, these were well-off, and these were poor people. And so the witnesses were too numerous to question whether he was God. And the Greek culture had no problem with proclaiming a God rising from the dead, but to have a human in a human body rise from the dead seemed absolutely ridiculous and contrary. And and today, it's fascinating that the argument has almost turned the other way. People have no problems admitting that Jesus was a historical figure, that he was a good teacher, that he was a, maybe even a prophet and a religious leader, historically. But if you start talking about the miracles that went on and uh, that he is a god or the god, people sort of, most people will just sort of, you know, say, well, that's more fanciful thing. That's going beyond what he actually was all about. And so they'll question the character, the godly character of Jesus. The ancient world would question the human character of him. Today we question the godly character. And what's fascinating to me is that in the ancient world they couldn't question the godly character because there were too many witnesses. There were thousands of people that viewed this. He met with over 500 people from various places and various economic standards. He didn't just meet with the slaves. They couldn't write it off. There was too much evidence. So they had to admit, well, okay, he was a god or the god, but he certainly couldn't have been human. And so they questioned his character. And then in today's society, all those hosts of witnesses are dead now. They've been dead for nearly 2,000 years. So now what do we question? Well, now we, now we question his godly character. And thus, we don't experience the healing and wholeness that we need in our lives that we so desperately need and that is to be restored when we undermine God's character I'm going to say it again we undermine the message and then the message doesn't have the impact upon our lives that is the danger that we run into and we don't experience God's goodness in our lives we don't experience God's grace and his forgiveness in our lives we don't experience shalom and that is peace and wholeness and healing in our lives and so it's so important that we don't that we don't undermine God's character. In this passage found 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 9. In that passage, Paul picks out three particular names. Three particular names. Go back to the text and look. Which three names? He has Peter, James, and himself, Paul. Those are the three names that are particularly picked out. And here is what is so significant. Because by picking out those three names, he's making something very clear to all of us. It has enormous application for our life. 
See, Peter, who had denied him at his darkest of hours, three times, not just once, three times, and did it publicly, Jesus met him and reminded him of the promise that God would forgive him and give him a new, a new beginning. Reminded him that he came and he died and he rose again so that Peter could be forgiven of his past and move forward and become a great and mighty leader for God's kingdom here on this earth. We also have James, who didn't even believe. Well, he believed after he met Jesus and he rose from the dead and he saw that his dead brother was alive. And yet Jesus appears to James and offers him healing and reconciliation with the living God. And thus, James becomes this dynamic leader for God's kingdom. What a powerful testimony. He becomes a great leader in Jerusalem. He actually dies because of his belief in Jesus Christ. And then we have Paul. Paul who was persecuting and innocent Christians and hating them. And then he has an experience on the way to Damascus where he encounters the living God and Jesus. And in that place, his entire thinking got shifted and he had to review, he had to reevaluate everything that he once thought. And then we find that the one who is persecuting is now serving those exact same Christians and reaching beyond the borders of just the Jews, but also the Gentiles around the world, the Roman Empire. And he was mighty for God's kingdom. And the reason that we have these three particular people, these three particular men identified in this text, and why it is important for your life, is these were unlikely leaders. They were people that should not have been chosen, but yet by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, they became great for God's kingdom. They were given another chance. They experienced God's healing and God's forgiveness in their lives. And maybe today, you need to experience that in your own life. If that is you today, I would like us to go into a prayer. And it is simply this, and you can follow along with me. Lord Jesus, I ask of you to heal me and forgive me of my sins. Lord, I want you to lead, not me, but you to lead me for your kingdom so that I could be mighty for your will and purpose. I ask this in Christ Jesus' name, the name above every name. Amen.